Hey, my name is Matt Storr and I repair saxophones for a living. And today I'd like to talk to you about a V. Martin tenor magna edition. Now the Martin committee three, I've got a video on that, but this is the magna, which is kind of like their, uh, you know, ultra top of the line, super deluxe version of the Martin. And this one has been gold plated. Um, and this is, this gold plate is original. This is all original. This horn was in nearly pristine original condition when it came to me including the original pads, which one of the differences between the Magna and the regular tenor was they had oversized resonators. And these, you can see, they've actually gold-plated the resonators and the backing washer, which is just <laughs> nuts to gold-plate the backing washer, something no one would ever see until now. Um, so the main differences between a The Martin tenor and a Magna are, one, you've got this, you can't see it here because it's gold-plated, but you've got this nickel nickel silver cross on the neck and on the bell. You've also got this little um, adjustable kind of like stopping key for the uh, octave key, which is nice. I've got a video on how to set up these springs because it's very easy to overextend this on a regular Martin and bend these springs. And it's not like immediately apparent how you should put it back together. So it's actually really nice to have this little stopper here. Um, other thing that was different is you can't see it, but the key barrels, so the rods for the pivot rods and the hinge tubes for the hinge keys are all solid nickel silver. So super ultra durable key work. It's also got adjustable bumpers for the low C, low B and B flat. And the left hand pinky table is a little bit modified. It's got this extra roller over here so you can roll from B to B flat more easily. Um, and also like that's just a really pretty pinky table. Getting these Martins exactly right on the left-hand pinky table is difficult, but so worth it. They're very smooth, very easy, very light, believe it or not. Um, let's see, what can I see here? Right, it's so quick. You can even, I mean, you can look at my thumb and see how much it deforms to press it, right? Like not much, it's very, very fast. Even the C-sharp is not very difficult. Um, and it's really, really quick and just super easy to use. Uh, the key is to have this be in perfect operating condition, have this set up perfectly, have the pads sealing perfectly, and then spring it all very lightly. And that can be difficult um, for many reasons, but one of the things with these Martins is they've got a lot of long rods. So like your B flat, which goes from here to here. Um, let's see, this key, right? That's actually a long rod. On most saxophones, that would be a pivot uh, screw key, which meaning it'd be held from either end of the pivot screw. This has a long rod going through it. And that can easily get damaged over time um, and get bent. And having it be absolutely free like this, getting it back to being that way can be difficult. Now you'll notice when it's on its side here, these keys actually don't have enough energy or the springs don't have enough energy to hold themselves up on, them own, on their own because this is such a long fulcrum here. The mechanical advantage that the spring has is not very great. When it's in proper playing condition, obviously it's fine, um, but you got to spring it like as light as possible, basically just a little bit faster than your fingers, um, and that's really going to be the way that the instrument works best. Um, another thing that would be different is, let's see here, the octave key. It's got a different spatula and an oversized pearl. It actually is considerably more comfortable than the regular Martin. Um, and that's pretty much it. There's not a whole lot extra about this horn compared to the regular Martin, um, other than this one in particular being gold plated. You've just got, I mean, it really, I don't know, Martins have this weird thing where they're actually really, really beautiful instruments. They're not thought of that way, but that beauty doesn't really appear until it's in like perfect operating condition where everything is where it's supposed to be. It's like an emergent property where, you know, it's, more beautiful than the sum of its parts. And it doesn't really become as beautiful as I think it is anyways, until it's exactly where it's supposed to be, set up exactly how it's supposed to be. And it's just gorgeous, right? And these play so well. Um, it's very, very quick under the fingers when set up correctly. You get those pads so that they're really, really seating well, super flat, super thin. They want really, really thin pads. You can see the original pads are very thin with a tiny, tiny bit of adhesive behind them. Um, I put more adhesive, but I still use very thin pads. You do not want to be trying to bend these key cups around in order to fit thicker pads, especially on these with the nickel silver uh, key work. 
that can be really hard to undo. It makes it feel wrong. It makes it, it makes it look wrong. It takes away that beauty that I'm talking about. And unfortunately, a lot of people do that. You know, they stock one type of pad. They stock thick, cheap pads, and they will just bend the absolute shit out of the geometry of an instrument like this that is supposed to have thin pads originally. Um, and that can be hard to undo. It can be undone, but it's something that is difficult to do. Um, and it's something that needs to be done if you want it to play the way it's supposed to play because altering the geometry changes not just the relationship of the keys to each other, but the relationship of the pad to the tone hole. Now you'll notice this is a fairly low key height, right? But that's what these were actually designed for is fairly no, low, not like wide open, not really low, but like fairly low, like medium, a tiny bit below this, and it starts to back up a little bit above this and the intonation isn't as good. The intonation on this instrument is actually extremely good, um, better than most other tenors uh, of this time period. But the moderately low key height seems like that is kind of the place that that all springs from. And you can't do that if you don't have your keys set up like in the geometry that they're supposed to with relatively thin pads so they get out of the way quickly. Um, Let's see, what else? So most of what you're going to want to know is going to be on my regular Martin committee overview, which I've done. Um, and there's also, like I said, a video on the, on the neck uh, spring, which I will go ahead and link you to. Um, but if you see a Magna pop up, usually they're a bit more expensive than the regular committee. If you like those features that I just pointed out, the one thing I really like is this B flat, um, the difference in the B flat with that roller on the end. That actually seems really worth it. This is not a huge deal, but it's nice. But that B-flat is a really nice thing. And I mean, if you were super into it, you might look into modifying like your Martin to be that way because it really does add a lot to it. Um, it kind of reminds me of the difference between the um, European version of the Selmer Radio Improved and then the American version had this extra little roller on the side B-flat. So Martin was not the first person to do something like this. Um, Selmer actually had a very similar mechanism on the Radio Improved and maybe even the Super. Um, where they just basically just added a roller uh, on the edge so you could go this way as well as down. Um, but yeah, so that is a The Martin Magna in original gold plate tenor saxophone. I don't know if you can see, put new gold plated resonators in there. It just plays so good. Oh man, what a wonderful horn this is. These The Martins, I think, are very undervalued. Um, the problems that you have with them is fitting the neck is difficult because this giant teardrop is in the way. Uh, you have to actually take the tenon out because they're too thick to expand from the inside. Um, getting that neck fit to be perfect is hard. And the setup can be difficult. And the difference between when these are as light, as fast, as positive as they're supposed to feel and what they usually feel like or what they feel like after, uh, you know, coming on the wrong side of someone using thick pads, they just feel terrible and the intonation can be kind of wonky and they're just not, they don't feel like good horns, but man, when they're in proper operating condition, these are just so good. So yeah, that's about it. Also, um, if anyone has been paying attention, I shattered my wrist uh, earlier this year and um, there's my surgery scar. I'm doing a lot better. Um, I can you know, do what I need to do and I'm back to work. I'm a little slower than I was before, uh, and I don't have it all back, but I'm going to get most of it back, which is really good. There was a little bit of time where we weren't really sure which way it was going to go, but it seems like everything's going to be okay for me, so I got really lucky um, and had my, my surgery went the right way, so that was really great. But yeah, hope you found this helpful, useful, informative. My name is Matt Storr. I repair saxophones for a living. Thanks for watching. Hey, sorry for the um, weird addendum here, but I'm actually out camping right now, and i um, Weirdly, there's like a cell tower on the mountain. Like I'm in the middle of nowhere and like I have faster internet now than I have at home. So I'm uploading some videos. Uh, the one you just watched with the Martin, I'm not actually 100% certain about the nickel key barrels um, on everything. I think that's true, but I'm not 100% certain. And since this one was gold, I couldn't like see, right? So um, if I find out for sure, I will uh, edit the description. But if that ends up being incorrect, I apologize.